Welcome back, freedom lovers. <laughs> All right, settle down, settle down. Um, we're about to present a new board, which is composed of new and old members, uh, not necessarily in terms of age, but in terms of experience. Um, so uh, here we have um, Meg Ford, which is joining the board this year. And right beside her is uh, Nurissi Sa Sanchez, who, who happens to be elected as uh, our president of the board. And, and as our secretary this year, we have uh, Cosimo, who was also on the board the previous year. And then we have uh, Alexandre Franck, who was also on the board who serves as a vice secretary. Um, and we have here uh, Alain Day, who was on the board previously. <laughs> he holds the position of vice president. So, yeah. And we have the Sean McCanns. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, unfortunately, due to uh, some untimely printing accident, Jim Hall has been stuck in an annual report. So, well, we have uh, Giko standing in for Jim here this year. <laughs> and with that, we're starting the q and I believe. No. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, before we actually dive into the Q&A, we wanted to say a huge thanks to uh, last year's board members, Jeff, uh, Andrea Very, who could not come to Guadec this year, and also Kat, who is actually not on the board anymore, but still our treasurer. So huge thanks to Kat for doing that, and to our board. Um, also, a huge thanks to the membership team and to the um, elections committee for pulling off another successful election this year. So, thank you. <laughs> and with that, we're going to start the Q&A. This is your opportunity to ask us questions uh, about anything you'd like, including ponies, I don't know, uh, anything. Uh, Runner? Okay, Bastion. And then I'll keep this up here. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, is Rachel Stallman still on foundation list, correcting people about GNU Linux? <laughs> as, that, as this every year. I, I believe you would has, have to ask someone who admins that list. Is anybody who admins that list I don't know the answer to that question. First, I want to thank all of you for um, for being on the board. Um, and I am curious, what would you state is the board biggest challenge you're facing this year, or what have the new board find anything it want to achieve during the during its terms next term? Um, so obviously, top of the list is getting an executive director. Um, that's not something that we're primarily responsible for, but we will obviously be involved in that process and we'll be uh, making sure that we uh, react quickly when we're presented with a, a candidate by the, the, uh, the, the committee who's doing that work for us. And we're going to be making sure that we're kind of on top of, of what's going on there and making sure that everything moves as it should. Um, other priorities, I think, probably um, 
continuing to support our conferences, making sure that we get sponsorship brochures out in a timely fashion, making sure that we're talking to partners about conference sponsorship. That's obviously an important source of income for us. And I think apart from that, the other thing is we're kind of going into a process of thinking about what we want to achieve as a board. And we had our all-day meeting uh, two days prior to Guadalajara, and we had our advisory board the day before. And those were both really um, interesting meetings where we had quite a lot of ideas and we're thinking about how we can possibly expand the role of the board and setting ourselves new objectives. But that's still quite new and we're going to have to be exploring that in the coming weeks and months. Does, Do, is, that does that answer, answer your question? Yeah, it's a good answer, I think. Okay. So, thank you. Um, hey, um, as Kat earlier uncautiously said, we can ask follow-up financial questions. Um, <laughs> just, just vague question like how, how much is in the bank account like any ballpark figure or whatever like that Ooh. what camera hi camera um let me just do a quick back of the envelope uh, calculation out of i'm only going to go and talk about no money not money we hold for other organizations i think there is around three hundred fifty thousand dollars at the moment yeah does anyone else have any finance questions hi andreas um, one second let me pass you the microphone yeah. um so <laughs> kind of uh, related financially with those money uh how much is uh, a how much is a salary of a executive director ish per year <laughs> And um, how much is uh, usually the ad board income? Okay, so I think the salary of our previous executive director was about $90,000 plus some benefits and travel costs. Um, and at the moment, the advisory board fees are slightly less than that. What we invest this year was $80,000. But... Uh, if we get an executive director, I should hope that they would bring in more money yeah. through advisory board, um, new advisory board members, and also through increasing personal donations and other sources as well. Um, I think Alberto had a question, if someone could take a microphone up for him. So uh, in the slides, you mentioned the amount of, uh, well, the, the size of the budget for the uh, Hackfest um, mm -hmm. sponsorship. Uh, so that was 40,000. I was wondering, what was this year's budget to sponsor people coming to WADEC? Pardon? How, many, so, how much so, did we pay to sponsor people to come to WADEC? Yes. That's the question. So that I okay. know the, um, so. so our budget for WADEC sponsorship is normally 35,000 euros. That was the budget we had this year. It's We had the same for the last two years as well. Um, and we offered pretty much all of that to within $500 or so, well, 500 euros or so. Um, unfortunately, a number of people couldn't make it. I haven't got the final figure yet on what we are spending because we haven't received all the receipts, but it's under that. Also, Alberto, as your, well, <laughs> well, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, um, any more financial questions? Okay, well, glad you're all so interested in finances. And um, <laughs> if anyone thinks of anything else they want to ask me, then just call me back. Any questions? Um, how often does the board meet these days? I mean, not meet, but also maybe video conference or telephone or... 
Yeah, so we have regular weekly meetings via teleconference, um, but we've also been talking about potentially having some kind of leadership meeting, um, doing like a leadership hack fest even, um, because there are some bigger issues sometimes that pop up that require more time. Um, but yeah, we definitely do a weekly meeting to just check in on ongoing projects. Uh, we only meet here face to face every year. This is the only face to face meeting that we have. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so I heard some stuff through the grapevine yesterday, but I, I wanted to ask: um, Are there any plans to hire uh, hire sysadmins for the next next year? So we had um, how long ago was that? Two years or so? The sysadmin fund rate longer. Um, a, a fundraiser to to pay assist um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't an employment situation it was you know contract work uh, part time um, and Andrea was doing that work um, we then used up some general funds uh, to continue some of that work after the funds from that um, that campaign had ended uh, we have had some discussions about possibly doing another campaign uh, around getting more funds for sysadmin work. Um, I, I don't think that there's anything solid right now. We recognize that uh, there's a need, but we're also looking at you know the, um, the financial implication, implications of hiring a new ED. So um, we've talked about it, but there's no solid plans right now. One aspect of that is if we are going to do a fundraising campaign, it would be nice to know from the community what kind of sysadmin work they would like to see done. You know, we're not just raising that, we wouldn't just be raising that money to maintain the infrastructure that we've got. We also want to improve it. And if we're spending foundation money on that, then, you know, we, we would obviously be interested to know what the community would like to see from that. And that would be really useful in terms of... Um, informing our decisions, I think. Uh, three or four years ago, um, I'm hoping three, but I'm thinking four, we did a security and privacy Friends of Gnome fundraiser. It's not working? Ah, okay. Sorry. Uh, three or four years ago, uh, we did a, a security and privacy Friends of Gnome fundraiser. And uh, to my knowledge, we have not spent any of that money on security or privacy or spent it at all, as far as I'm aware, uh, which is uh, not great after so long. Uh, we kind of dropped the ball on that. Do we have any plans on how to use that money at long last? Yes, so the, uh, you're right, the money is still in the bank. Uh, it's still um, basically saved for exactly that purpose. Um, I have proposed yesterday uh, one of the unconference lots uh, to exactly discuss uh, this with the, with the community. Um, uh, part of the problem um, has has been um, honestly like identifying a group of people that can uh, even you know decide where to spend that money. Um, uh, so that's why you know I uh, I want to propose kind of an unconference law to uh, get uh, a sense of where the community wants to wants that money to go. Uh, I have some ideas myself. So um, you know the. Uh, ideally, the plan is we, we do this, we come up with a, a short list of like, you know, uh, three or four uh, things that seem realistic to do uh, with the uh, budget. I think it's something between 20 and, so, yeah, something around 20K, uh, $20,000. Uh, and then we would put up like um, a, a call for bids, uh, basically, where, uh, you know, companies or individuals can uh, uh, send their uh, proposals um, and then we would choose one and, and do it. So that's the plan, and uh, vote my uh, unconference lot if you want to see this happen, basically, so that we can talk about this tomorrow. I selfishly uh, have a question myself, um, uh, and that is, um, we saw recently with uh, GNOME Maps that um, our free software depends on, well, not necessarily non-free infrastructure, but infrastructure provided by third parties. 
um, and that we can't really rely on that as a community going forward. Um, does the board have any plan on what to do about the possible need for an increased expenditure on infrastructure um, in the future? I'm going to speak a little bit personally. Um, I mean, I think in that case, um, we have solved it in the, in the short term. We found a new provider. Um, uh, I, I personally think that if we could provide some sort of uh, proxy service, at least, to our actual provider, that no? Andre says no. I just think that that allows us to switch things over. That's me. I'm not speaking for the board. As far as I remember that uh, thread, either in, in Buxilla or on the mailing list, I think the issue with, with proxying was uh, simply that it was against the terms of services. Okay. okay. Uh, of that new provider we're using, and that's, I think. Okay, so that's something we have to be aware of. Um, I don't know that we could ever have the infrastructure to actually provide the map tiles on our own servers. Um, it, it's not something that's immediately on our plate. It can be if... Uh, if you want it to be, right? Um, but this is something that possibly would require um, some sysadmin time, so this would be um, going into that, what would we spend sysadmin money on? Well, that, that would be one thing. So um, yeah, if, if, there are th if there's infrastructure you believe we need, uh, then let us know so that we know that. Yeah. So something else I want, I want to add. Um, Again, like a speaking person, I think one way that uh, we can make this work is um, by identifying, uh, you know, companies that can be interested in uh, sponsoring or maintaining part of that infrastructure uh, in the same way that we have, you know, um, uh, Red Hat, for instance, maintaining the uh, the build servers for things like build.gnome.org or sdk.gnome.org. Um, there, there is no like active initiative uh, on on the board side uh, for this particular um, piece of infrastructure for the map server at the moment. But uh, if you know any of you uh, works for a company that may be interested in helping out, that would be uh, of course very much appreciated. The other thing that the board can do is help to negotiate those kind of arrangements and. As the maps situation was going on, we were discussing it and talking about ways that we could support the maps team. And so we are available if any of you maintain applications where you're needing to talk to to companies about about infrastructure. I have a related question uh, with regards to the. One of, one of the students working on uh, the uh, bookmark uh, syncing. So it was using the, uh, the Mozilla infrastructure. Uh, where was uh, the board involved in uh, negotiating? Are they OK um, uh, with, with using their infrastructure? Or uh, was it just a, like a prototype kind of approach? I'll let Michael ask, answer that one. <laughs> Uh, yes, that was one of the reasons uh, that we chose the Mozilla service. They're fine with us using the existing Firefox infrastructure. They're, they have some terms and conditions that we have to be aware of and follow, but the, the, for the most part, it's just don't try to trick users. Don't try to install malware, such things. Don't pretend to be Firefox. Um, so more, more than a question, this is going to be a bit of a, a request or a comment. Uh, we, now that we're speaking about infrastructure, I wanted to remind everyone that uh, Qualcomm, Banana Pie, and ARM uh, gave us hardware this year that is on our uh, data centers for the flat pack and continuous uh, uh, initiatives. And I have single board computers that if GNOME developers want to use, please shout on me. And I wanted to request the board that whenever you see an opportunity to highlight this kindness from, from these companies, please uh, keep it in mind.
Um, it's on, right. Uh, so I have a, a question. You know, uh, we, we've done some great stuff with our trademarks in terms of um, the stores and things like that. What other, do you think, business agreements that we could make um, by the foundation that would continue to spread our awareness elsewhere, outside of traditional circles? Speaking personally, I'm not sure whether agreements are what we're interested in rather than relationships. Relationships or I, I use agreements because of the of the the, the stores, but yes, you can yeah. that that would be fine as well. Yeah. I mean one of the nice things about those agreements is that they have actually led to relationships developing. Like it sounds like a punitive thing, but it's it's actually not at all and you know, we've got some great relationship with Hello Tux and Unix stickers and they're like making donations and we're talking to them about products we'd like to see and things like that. So that's really nice. Uh. Um, and now I'm, I'm speaking, you know, this is my, my personal opinion, something that I would like to see and I don't know if it's exactly the same thing that, you know, you're asking actually, but um, perhaps um, right now, you know, the, the the only really way, like formal way, of companies to interact with the, with the foundation is through the advisory board, um, and um, it would be nice to bring more companies into the advisory board ecosystem, uh, and per perhaps you know the uh, the levels of uh, the current levels of uh, engagement of sponsorship and monetary involvement uh, make that uh, a little harder than it than it than it could be. Uh, so there has been some brainstorming uh, between, like you know, among a few of us, to try to make that uh, uh, a little bit more accessible for smaller companies or potentially, you know, freelancers or individuals that still want to have a um, uh, an open line of communication, like a first-hand uh, line of communication with the foundation, uh, but maybe don't, they don't necessarily have uh, the, the the financial means to afford the current fees. So that's personally something that I would like uh, to see. When I um, first ran for my first stint on the board uh, over five years ago, um, I think one of the things I said in my candidacy emails was that I would love us to have partnerships with hardware vendors. Um, and that's still something that I think would be really, really interesting. Um, but I'm older and grayer and more cynical. Um, and I, it's realistically not something that um, uh, this board of volunteers could take on. Um, and I'm, I'm not even sure it's something that an, that an executive director could take on uh, by themselves, given the other massive workload that we throw onto an executive director. So um, that's an area that I, I really, I find personally very interesting, but I don't, see us pursuing unless there is a uh, kind of a surge from within the community uh, to make that happen. More questions? What is the current board planning to do in, for the next year to increase our income? Hire an executive director, improve our um, personal fundraising. We've been looking into revamping Friends of Gnome, helping the engagement team to perform more fundraising events getting our conference sponsorship brochures out early, in good shape, offering good packages uh, for sponsors who want to pay for sponsorship for all our events. Anything else? Oh yes, yes. Uh, potentially restructuring the advisory board fees. Okay, so following on from the executive director a bit, um, what do you expect 
the hired executive director to be able to do to increase income? And how much do you expect one to uh, cost to, uh, to the foundation, including all expenses? Who wants to answer that? Cat, 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 cat. <laughs> um, as you know, when we have employees, uh, we have someone who is on our board who is uh, officially appointed as um, that employee's manager. That's, you guys might not know that. Kat knows that, though. Um, and I, I think I exact figures of how much we would expect an executive director to bring in within exact time frames um, is something that... Uh, perhaps the board needs to discuss. It needs to be between that manager and that employee. And it, it in particular, I'm not comfortable giving a number because then I'm kind of setting a promise to whatever candidates might be out there. Um, uh, so right rather now. than giving any numbers, what in what ways do you think an executive director is likely to bring in more income? Like what will they, could they possibly do? Um, the, the the obvious ones. I mean, the there there are some some that are obvious. Some that could be more creative. But um, I think one of the um, you know one of the current limitations of like ourselves is that we volunteer our time. So uh, someone that can actually you know uh, make it their job to reach out and follow up and you know keep uh, uh, pushing and spreading as much as they can. The uh, uh, you know the GNOME project and asking for money and demonstrating the value of the GNOME project to potential investors. Uh, it's a full-time job. I mean, there, it's not something that we can that we can take on with our current workload. So that that's that's you know the obvious one for me. Anyone else? Okay, so I'll weigh in because I've had to do this for the past two months. Um, for Alaska no. Fundraising is really difficult. It takes a certain amount of persistence, but you also have to put in a certain kind of messaging of what your project stands for um, and where it is. And it's a little difficult because um, the board does not tell, go, the project goes where it goes and the board follows because we don't control, the board doesn't control where the project goes. So each time we're doing messaging, the only thing um, you could do is, is sort of the, the executive director has used their influence to kind of tell you guys, this is where we need to go when we need to get money. So that means if, if IoT is a big thing, then we need to figure out how we place GNOME in IoT because that's where, that's where companies are giving money or wanting to spend money on. So where the executive director goes is kind of is where money goes is going to go. They got to go where the money goes to some extent. Um, or we have to find new places to go. So that's, that's sort of what I've learned in the past couple of months. Uh, and there's a persistency. You got to keep going there, making the sale, coming back, then going again. Um, I've sometimes sat and stared at the ceiling, figuring out how to how to do this. So, some some something to think about. Does that answer your question? I'm going to agree with you, and I'm going to um, maybe say exactly what you just said in different words. Um, I think one of the challenges an executive director faces. Um, Unlike in a corporate scenario where you have employees and you go out and you try to make uh, business connections um, and you can you can commit to some extent to the technical direction of um, the company that you're the, the director of uh, to make these connections. And the executive director simply doesn't have that power to control our technical direction. The board doesn't control technical direction. The executive director doesn't. So that's a... Uh, definitely a challenge for the executive director, but I would say um, it's something that I, I would I would hope that the executive director could um, uh, 
engage the community and inform the community of what uh, they have found uh, corporate interest in. Um, and I encourage everybody within the community to um, become friends with the executive director and to, you know, to listen to that feedback that the executive director is able to bring back to us from, from where we can get more interest. So I guess we're on this topic of, of executive director. And I was having this conversation a little bit earlier after looking at your financial report and I was measuring the past three years and I kind of threw in the executive director's salary in there and as well as their, their travel. Uh, and, 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 you know, the Gnome project is in a plus right now where two years ago it looked like it was in a negative, right? Um, is there any thought as to perhaps just not have an executive director? Do they have some sort of legal um, application for the foundation in that sense? Would it be possible to actually look at a different position title um, where you would look for a person that could engage with what the GNOME project and you as a board would really like to enter into? So one of the things that the executive director does is not just go out and find new partners, but helps to keep the ones we have. So that's that's a really important from concern for us. We need to make sure that we have strong relationships with our existing supporters so we don't lose them. So I think for most of us on the board, I think I'd be right in saying that, you know, not having an executive director long term, like we'd like that not to be an option for that reason. There was something else I was gonna say. Just the, re really quickly, um, if it's the title that you're that you're asking about, I I don't know that that you know that is something that I've wondered myself, um, and I've even you know a, a, a couple of people have given me suggestions. They're like, oh, maybe you shouldn't be looking for an executive director. Maybe you should be looking for a general manager or like some other uh, some other form of, uh, of, of of you know some other title. Uh, well, to me, that ultimately doesn't change the nature of the fact that you know what that person would ultimately do but sure but you know a title comes with money and there's you know a title like executive director there's a certain expectation and of course then you have infrastructure surrounding that in any sort of business environment um even though this is a foundation and and even even non have uh executive directors but you know, you look at how big those institutions are, how big those organizations are. I, I just, I don't know, I thought I'd bring it up. Yeah, really? I've remembered what I was going to say, and it kind of um, follows on from that. I think Bradley wants to speak at the back. Um, we've had that discussion a little bit within the board. I th think what we discovered is that if you want someone who's going to go out and raise money, they need to be at that level where they are able to talk to the people who control the money. And if you want someone who is at that level and has that Rolodex and the contacts, then you have to pay for that. If, if you hire someone, a more junior candidate, with the idea that you're going to pay them less, they're maybe not going to be able to do that critical fundraising that you need them for. So it's, there is, you know, it's difficult. Uh, so uh, most of you know I'm involved in an organization called Software Freedom Conservancy that's a fiscal sponsor. So we're basically a group of many different organizations uh, like GNOME. We have projects that are actually uh, financially larger than GNOME. We have some of our projects that have in their earmarked account uh, 400 or $500,000, uh, more than GNOME currently has. Um, and the biggest argument I constantly make to them is that they're making a huge mistake by walking around with giant cash balances. While it sounds good to say, you know, Project Foo has $500,000 in the bank, that money was probably coming from donors, donors that expected your organization to do something with the money to advance the project. Certainly you can debate how you should invest that money and what type of staff you should. 
uh, have. That's a good debate to have. Should it be an executive director? Should it be another staff? But I think uh, just uh, speaking from another nonprofit, just to give friendly advice, GNOME should spend its money some way to advance the GNOME project, not let it sit in the bank. GNOME's always been a fiscally conservative organization. It's never been in the red with regard to regard to their accounts. So the, if it goes wrong, you lay the person off when you start to go broke. It's what you have to do. Any good executive director will know that's their fate if they don't raise money. So I, I think the board's making here is making the right decision. I wish some of our member projects at Conservancy would hire a staffer of their own. Like we have our own staff at the top level, but they should have their own staff. They have money for it. They don't. They just let it sit in the bank. So I hope Gnome won't let its money sit in the bank and we'll, we'll hire someone. Um, so speaking from as uh, someone who's been working for a Gnome-rated consultancy for the last decade, there was a long time when uh, the first five years of we had Nokia and Nokia spent a lot of money using Gnome not as a desktop but as a platform to build a different product. And when they disappeared and stopped showering money on, on the project, Gnome 3 happened and there was a disinterest in the platform from developers towards building a desktop, a product. And I think if as a community we choose to focus on the desktop, we'll have to accept that there's fewer companies who are interested. That we're going to rely on Red Hat and Endless and SUSE and that, that's about it. And if we want to have more companies interested joining the ad board, developing GNOME-based products, we have to care more about GNOME as a software development platform and as a bag of pieces that are stable, that have stable APIs, and nuts. And even if that makes making the desktop a bit harder. Or we can say the desktop is important and the, the rest are just uh, artifacts. This is a bit of a comment. This is where the debate gets going, right? Yes. Who wants to go first? So. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, consultancies. Great stuff. So, one of the problems with having a platform and not having a product um, is, uh, it, oh well, if the platform is the product, um, you're liable to get uh, pushed in 20 different directions because no single, well, consultancies don't drive it, uh, they consume it, and companies that use consultancies or decide to use a platform as a product uh, will likely uh, try to push it in different directions because everyone has its own view of the thing. Um, the reason why uh, people um, started using GNOME as their platform is because we had a fairly complicated vision that was driven by our uh, desktop. Um, we tried to fix the Linux desktop, um, op the entire operating system really, from uh, hardware management to uh, security to the desktop UI and everything else. And the reason why Nokia was able to take that and put it inside a tablet is because we actually made it work. Um, so, sorry. Um, so, the we should continue uh, pushing the desktop, and pushing the desktop um, allows us to push the platform. And somebody else can take the platform and remove part of it, remove the shell, for instance, and have a fairly competent uh, operating system that you can build a shell on top. Uh, that's what Endless did. Um, and that's also what Nokia did, partly. Our platform at the time was pretty dire. We had to basically implement it, but that's what happened. Uh, we did. Um, we actually did an entire operating system. You cannot take any other operating system that is Linux-based apart from Android, and Android has like Google behind it. Um, I, I, Google has more engineers working on Android than people in this room. Many more. <laughs> um, so the end result is that 
the only way we can concentrate on making the platform better is if we have an actual goal, an actual product that we can use to drive the platform. And the desktop is our, our product. Um, so uh, if, we, if we stop concentrating on that and we start concentrating on this is the platform is a ba big bag of Legos that you can take and do whatever you want, um, the engineering challenges grow exponentially because the interaction between the components and the vision decreases exponentially because now you don't have to care about the entire collection of things. You have to care about only your little project. Um, so I don't want another Nokia. Uh, Nokia almost killed this project. It, yes, a lot of people got a lot of money out of it. Um, not many people that are actually in this room and not many people that stayed around. I didn't get that much money out of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish, <laughs> but I was not the owner of the consultancy. Um, but yeah, the, the, the way we do things is concentrating on our thing and try to make it better, trying to make it better than any, everybody else and provide a platform to people that want to consume it. If you want to provide, if you want to use platform for your own product, then you're very much welcome to do so. The important thing is not to basically block everything else to just provide the desktop. Is to continue to grow the platform, to continue to fix the problems that, that live in the Linux space, but continue to do so with the perspective of GNOME as a, as a complete platform, as a complete desktop, as a complete operating system for people to use. Um. I, I, I mostly agree with, with Emanuele. Um, I, I just want to add that I, I don't like platform versus desktop to be uh, a, an either or a dichotomy like that. Um, I, I I agree. We need we need a we need a product vision. In, at the end of the day, uh, it can be whatever. It can be a desktop. It can be you know. Right now, it is uh, to drive the project forward. And then there are things that build on top of it. There are some things that we can certainly improve uh, to make it more attractive to external companies as a platform. Uh, for instance, make the developer experience much better. Um, create an application ecosystem through initiatives like uh, Flatpak and Lusk Gnome and things like that. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be making a great desktop. Uh, because that we, without that, there is really nothing that holds it all together in my, in my mind. Olivier, um, when you ask that question, I'm kind of interested. Is there anything specific that you would like to see from the board in this re regard? You know, we're, we're, we're sitting here as your elected board members. So like, just to clarify, like, what? What's your motivation behind asking that question? Like, what would you like to see from us? It wasn't really a question for the board, but more for the, the community about what's, what we want. And I think it's absolutely fine that we say we want to do a desktop and that uh, we have some cool artifacts that come out of that, but they're just like side effects of doing the best desktop. A bit like Firefox decided that they're doing a browser and there's a platform underneath and they don't really care about the platform as a platform for anything else than doing a browser. And so everyone else stopped using their platform. Right? So uh, while at some point people use Zool Runner to make other things and they said, well, this is not what we're doing. We're doing the best browser. And uh, the platform kind of disappeared from... And right now lots of people just switch to Qt because they're a company that made a platform. And it's a very good platform that's easy to use, that's really good things. And I think it's hurting us as a desktop that our developer platform is not as good as Qt in many ways. Right? We have Builder, but it's, it's not Qt Creator. We, uh, we have C, which is you know, problematic. We have GObject, which is just not as nice as what the Qt people provide, because this is not our, really our focus. <clears throat> nope, no, he's saying no now. Um, I, I mean, this kind of got clarified, but the board does not set technical direction. So if the community says it's making a desktop first, 
Um, that's the community. Uh, but I will kind of reiterate what I said earlier. Um, you know, if we have an executive director who is out talking to companies and we have an actual company that's interested and is saying, but we need this from your platform, uh, I think that's somewhere where we need to listen to um, real feedback. Um, but I'm, I'm hesitant to say, let's strip it all apart and just do a platform without, without anybody out there to consume it. Um, I mean, I think Shree's had interesting things to say about um, making GNOME the, the development platform of choice for uh, IoT stuff. Or uh, Yeah, so, um, but that's something that, I, I don't know, I think we need to find, find consumers and, and let that help, help drive the direction. But that, uh, of course, has to come from the developers. Two really quick points. Um, first, we talk to our advisory board, and we do act as a liaison between our advisory board and the rest of the community. So we do listen to what those partners have to say, and we take that advice very seriously. Um, so with regards to kind of what people need out of, the, out of Gnome, whether it's desktop stuff, platform stuff, like we, we, commute, we do try and play that role in guiding what the, what the project should be doing as much as we can without kind of setting like out a hard kind of direction. Um, the other points, I think something to do with, a lot of this is maybe to do with messaging and semantics. Um, you know, I think when we went to GNOME 3, we kind of uh, swung from one direction to the other. And as time has gone on, things have softened a little bit and there's a kind of openness to, to maybe have a bit of both approaches. And a lot of it is about how we present ourselves as a project and how we communicate uh, you know, what we do and what we make available to the wider world. So I, I think there's definitely a, a conversation to have around that, and I'd love to see more activity around that. Um, the engagement team has done a little bit of work in that area. We have some more information on the website that tries to be kind of uh, showcase some of the underlying technologies, and it isn't purely desktop about the desktop nowadays. But there's a lot more work that, there that that could be done and would be interesting to look at. I think. Shri. So, uh, so for me, um, I think uh, we're in, we're in a, in a in a really exciting time, right? With with the flat pack and everything else. Um, one of the nice things is we did separate uh, the platform from the user experience. So, when you're creating devices of different parts, uh, whether let's say like Middleboard Max or these small things, there's enough there we can create any kind of experience on there because if you got a device, you plug your the GNOME platform in and you know you have your run times, you're able to create an experience. I think for entrepreneurs, that's really cool, especially in this in this age where now we're we're kind of doing internet connected devices. Um, you know, there's I think there's opportunity there. And with, with the conference idea, this is exactly where we're actually trying to drive business for consultancies. Because if, we're, if that conference is successful, then we are providing business for all of you. Because where are they going to go to get that expertise initially, especially if they want to make modifications to that platform? So you know, this conference is for you guys as well. I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place to get, get everywhere, everyone in one place. And it's a honeypot, essentially. So that's so it, it's I don't I don't think we we should be focusing on this whole bag of stuff. We have everything we need to be successful right now. And, and Shri, when you say this conference, I as, I assume you're talking about Las Canal, yes, which everybody should attend. <laughs> I think that, uh, so you mentioned like a lot of companies don't really have as big of an interest in desktop. Um, people are moving more towards like mobile or like interest in mobile. Um, was that part of it? Not fast. Right, so. That into the microphone so that you can. 
think the desktop now is 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 it 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 works really well, and uh, we have really good desktops there. Uh, Norman, one of them, and we there's not so much business out there uh, doing desktop work, right? Because people at Red Hat do an amazing job. People at Endless, uh, even Canonical, right? There, um, the if we do a desktop, there's a really small set of big companies that do it, and you're not going to have a big ecosystem to con that will contribute. And pe people don't write new commercial desktop applications. Right? These just don't exist. Even in the proprietary world, on Windows and Mac, people just don't write new applications. They do uh, And I think that's, that's the point that I wanted to really talk about, and I know we've kind of berated this, but um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity with getting new like university students interested in this. Again, the next wave of entrepreneurs. Um, I think Endless is, part of what Endless is trying to do is like open up the doors and say there's, sure, maybe in this world that exists right now, people who already have computers, there's already like an established order, but that's such a small part of the actual world. And so if we can expose that to more people and, and kind of um, help uh, the world see that there are billions of other, um, you know, users out there that we haven't reached. That's where it becomes more exciting, and that's where Flatpak and Builder and all these technologies are really going to help more people become uh, a part of that new um, evolution of Linux applications. Um, and where I think we can start to convince. Um, you know, the Spotify's of the world and other, you know, companies to start building flat pack apps too, to help drive more users and all that kind of stuff. So um, I just wanted to um, expand a little bit on this topic. Um, for, 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 for some of us who were part of that, the good old Nokia days, it's easy to fall into this um, emotional trap of like uh, nostalgia. Uh, but when you actually look at the facts, uh, GTK has more contributors than ever. This year, uh, Endless is shipping two laptops that I know of <laughs> out there with, with a close to, a, I mean, it's pretty much the GNOME vision, but with their own, you know, uh, experience. Uh, and uh, we just, I just came out of a session where Bosch is shipping uh, like uh, parts of the GNOME stack in in cars, I I mean if I compare like the amount of uh, markets that we're actually tapping from the Nokia days to now, I think we're reaching a lot more people. I mean there are laptops being sold uh, with vanilla GNOME like the ones uh, Jeff shown, and and then there's the endless stuff. Uh, if there are no interest, if there's no interest about desktops, I, I don't, you know. <laughs> Uh, how how come that's happening, you know? And um, and there's also the Chrome OS stuff. Like Chrome OS is growing a lot, uh, and and so there's something there. There's room to provide something different than the uh, traditional desktop experience. And with regards to the point of like companies not investing big bucks in making desktop applications, that's probably actually a good thing for GNOME and for free software, because that means we don't have to replicate the myriad of corporate apps to actually replace Windows. If everything is a web app, then closed source software is irrelevant in, in terms of the OS that runs on my laptop from, from that perspective. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that we have a lot of things to be positive about. And if there's ever been a time where GNOME has been more interesting than this, I don't know about it. <laughs> I don't. Any more questions? So I'm, uh, I'm wondering, uh, one of the problems that I see with open source is that there's not enough, uh, it's hard to find a good business model, uh, especially for smaller apps if, if you make uh, Linux apps. Uh, is there any thought on um, open source funding? Are you thinking about, um, about this? I've, I've asked about this before, and I'm wondering if it's still a topic uh, on your mind. It, 
it's this is a topic that has come up repeatedly over the years. It always does. It's particularly topical at the moment with with all the discussion around Flatpak and how we're changing how applications are hopefully going to be distributed. And the whole point of that is to try and encourage a, a really strong ecos application ecosystem. I, just speaking personally, I'm really interested in how we could allow people to monetize free software and, and sell their apps via some kind of universal Linux kind of distribution platform. I think that, that could really change the game in a, in a really big way. <coughs> Whether that is a practical possibility or not is a, is, is a really big question. And it does, I don't think this problem needs to be solved within the GNOME project, because it, it's about more than GNOME. It, it needs to be truly cross-platform in every way. But we do obviously have an interest in trying to make that happen. And, and one of the basic problems that you have there is resources. So to maintain those distribution platforms uh, takes a lot of different kinds of resources. It, you, know, you need infrastructure, you need legal help, you need administrators to process payments if you're accepting money. I mean, that's the whole like financial apparatus that needs to be run, and it requires staff in which to do all of that. So there's a very, you know, this is, this is the, the um, problem we've always bumped into whenever we've discussed this in the past. You know, how, how do we get those resources? Are they available? Um, speaking purely on a personal basis, I'd be interested in seeing how, how the GNOME Foundation could help us to do that, hopefully in discussion with our partners. Whether it's a realistic project or not, I don't know. It might not be. I'd quite like to try just to see what happens. But, you know, that's something that the new board is going to have to discuss and agree as a group. Is that... Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, I, th I think we're done. Thank you very much. I know, yeah, don't leave. Um, we are now going to do the big reveal behind the pants winner. So first, I'm going to give you guys clues, see if you can guess who it is. Um, oh. <laughs> what are the pants? Yeah, sure. Do you want to... <laughs> I'm, uh, actually, I'm not even old enough to remember how the pants started, so I don't think anyone on this board is quite that old. Uh, there is a long-standing tradition in GNOME of giving a pair of pants... Uh, to somebody in recognition of their outstanding contribution to the project and to the community. So um, I think that's all you really need to know. <laughs> all right. So the pants winner this year has been contributing to GNOME since at least 1999. This person is known as the fixer and generally makes things better, getting to the root of the problem instead of just patching things up. This person does an incredible Swedish chef impression, been told. Uh, has also been involved with a, a lot of different technology, including GTK, GDK, uh, don't know what I wrote here. The old GDM greeter, high DPI support, Nautilus, Spice, GIO, and Flatpak. This year's winner is Alex Larson.
right. Thanks a lot. That warms my heart. I'll try to carry these forward the next year and make Flatpak even better. Thank you all. Thank you, Alex. And with that, we are done. Go forth and eat dinner.